Hello again, and welcome to Aviation News Talk, where we talk general aviation with relevant news and flying tips for pilots and student pilots to help keep you safe. I'm Max Truscott. I'm the author of several books on the Garmin G1000, 3000, 5000, and Perspective Glass Cockpits, and I'm the 2008 National Flight Instructor of the Year. Today, we'll be talking about the different classes of airspace and the visibility and cloud clearance requirements for each of those classes. And I'll give you some explanations for why the different numbers were chosen, which makes them a little easier to remember. And so that you don't miss next week's episode in whatever app you're listening to now, take a moment and just touch the subscribe or the follow key. Do it now so that next week's episode is downloaded for free. Last week in episode 249, we talked about flying IFR safely and professionally and about things your CFII might not have taught you. So if you didn't hear that episode, you may want to check it out at aviationnewstalk.com slash 249. And this is a listener-supported show supported by people like you. So think for a moment about what you might pay for a really good hour of ground instruction and sign up to support the show financially by going out to aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome. And when you do, I'll read your name on the show. This week in the news, the NAL report says the overall accident rate is down. The Cessna Caravan is getting a new fuel type, and we'll tell you what an airport manager was doing that got her fired. All this and more, and the news starts now. From avweb.com, NAL report finds overall accident rate decreased in 2020. The overall GA accident rate for 2020 decreased from 4.87 per 100,000 flight hours in 2019 to 4.69 per 100,000 hours, according to the 32nd edition of the Joseph T. Nall report. Recently released by AOPA's Air Safety Institute, the report also found that the rate of fatal accidents was down from 0.89 per 100,000 hours in 2019 to 0.83 in 2020. There were a total of 1,051 accidents for the year, 187 of which were fatal, with ASI noting that flight activity dropped significantly from 25.5 million hours in 2019 to 22.4 million hours flown in 2020, which looks like about a 10% decrease in flight hours. Not surprising because of the pandemic. For 2020, the Institute found that the overall accident rates decreased for non-commercial fixed-wing aircraft along with commercial and non-commercial helicopters. In the commercial fixed-wing segment, the accident rate jumped from 1.62 accidents per 100,000 hours in 2019 to 2.17 per 100,000 hours in 2020. ASI reported an overall decrease in weather-related accidents and a drop in fatal maneuvering accidents. The largest number of fatal accidents were stall-spin accidents. According to Robert Geske, AOPA ASI Manager of Aviation Safety Analysis, landing accidents continue to remain the leading type of accident, but thankfully they account for the lowest number of fatal accidents. From CPR.org, that's Colorado Public Radio, plane destroyed in mid-air collision over Boulder County was not transmitting location, investigators say. A home-built aircraft that collided with another small plane last month in northern Colorado, killing three people, was not automatically transmitting signals of its position as required for the airspace around Denver's airport. A preliminary report on the September 17 crash by the NTSB said both planes were required to transmit outgoing Automatic Dependent Surveillance Broadcast, or ADSB transmissions, which use satellites to provide updates on a plane's location to other planes in ATC. Neither was required to be in radio contact with ATC, it said. The Cessna 172 involved in the crash, which had a CFI and student pilot on board, was transmitting its location, but the Sonics Xenos, a light aircraft registered to Henry Butler, age 69, was not and had not transmitted such a signal since about two months before the crash, according to air traffic records. The Xenos took off from Platte Valley Air Park at 8.38 a.m., about five minutes before the Cessna took off to the north from the Rocky Mountain Metropolitan Airport, about 35 miles to the southwest of Platte Valley. The Xenos flew west, and after the Cessna turned east, their flight paths merged and both airplanes rapidly descended. From avweb.com comes a story about a bird strike that led to a fatal accident. On May 11, 2019, at about 15.30 Eastern Time, a Piper PA-30 Twin Comanche was destroyed when it collided with terrain near Naples, Florida, apparently out of control. The solo private pilot, male, age 71, was fatally injured. Visual conditions prevailed. The flight departed Key West at an unspecified time and operated on an IFR flight plan. The en route and initial approach flight phases were apparently uneventful, and at about 3.28 p.m., the pilot advised the tower he was on a five-and-a-half-mile final to runway 23, which was his last communication. 
The airplane collided with terrain about 4.3 miles from the approach end of runway 23. The rear seat headrest and two inflatable life vests were located about 440 feet from the accident site. A dead black vulture weighing 3.8 pounds was located among the wreckage. Feathers were found adhering to a blanket located near the separated inboard sections of the right wing. Swabs from the headrest and life vest contain either DNA or microscopic feathers from a black vulture. And in a related story, the NTSB has a report out on a fatal crash that occurred on December 17th, 2021, a little after noon in Florida. A Lake Amphibian, November 1402 Charlie, was destroyed in an accident in Auburndale, Florida. The pilot and passengers were fatally injured. According to FAA preliminary tracking data, the airplane departed from Lake Hartridge, Winter Haven, Florida, about 1130 in the morning. A witness located on the southwest shore of a lake about a tenth of a mile abeam the accident site reported that the airplane was flying toward his location at a fairly low altitude as the engine was making a sputtering noise. He added that he did not see any smoke or flames or other signs of distress. As the airplane continued toward his location, it descended at a steep angle and impacted the lake in a nose-down attitude. After impact, the airplane came apart and there was an immediate explosive ball of flames and smoke. During recovery of the wreckage, bird feathers, subsequently identified as those from a turkey vulture, were found wrapped around the fuel filler cap on the inside of the damaged and breached right-wing fuel tank. The carcass of a turkey vulture was found floating on the surface of the lake in the vicinity of the wreckage debris field. And I mentioned these two stories because just in the past month or two, I've had at least three incidents where I've had to intervene while flying an aircraft because the pilot did not take appropriate measures to avoid a large bird. And I'm not sure really why that's the case. Uh, perhaps these pilots had their head inside. Uh, some of them certainly were looking outside, but I'm just kind of stunned that uh, pilots are not taking more aggressive action to evade birds that they see in front of them. And one thing you should know is that most species of birds, when scared, will dive. So ideally, you want to pass above birds and not below them. If you do have to pass below them, then you want to fly significantly below them. From MSN.com, Virginia CFI 23 killed during flight lesson after a student caused the plane to stall and crash. A Swedish flight instructor was killed during a flight lesson in Virginia when a student made an error that caused a small plane to stall and crash. Last week, 23-year-old licensed commercial pilot Victoria Lungjungman began a flight lesson with two Hampton University students at Newport News Williamsburg International Airport, where Lungjungman worked as an instructor. The fatal crash occurred after an 18-year-old student attempted to pull the single-engine Cessna 172 plane up at too steep an angle while 100 feet in the air, according to a statement from Virginia State Police. The student and another 18-year-old student on board who has not been identified suffered life-threatening injuries. Le Zhengman was pronounced dead on the scene. And according to her Instagram account, she'd passed her CFI checkride in April, meaning she'd been a CFI for about six months. Now, we've had two accidents just in the last month or so in which CFIs have died with low-time student pilots. And I just want to mention something that I do all the time. You never read about this, but I think it's important for CFIs to always be guarding the control. So on every takeoff, my hand is located, oh, probably a half inch behind the side stick in the Cirrus aircraft that I'm usually in. And so I'm able to take control immediately. In fact, that helped considerably about a year ago when a pilot's seat slid back on takeoff. I was able to get control of the aircraft within just a fraction of a second. So CFIs, please keep your hands very close to the yoke uh, during every takeoff and every landing. From the DailyBeast.com, Georgia Southern student killed by propeller of a plane he rented for a date. A college student's date ended in tragedy on Sunday night this past weekend when he was killed by the propeller of a light aircraft he'd rented for the evening, authorities said. The freak accident took place at the Statesboro Bullock County Airport in Georgia, Bullock County Coroner Jack Futch said. The victim was identified as 23-year-old Sanyi Aliyu of Atlanta, a sophomore management major at Georgia Southern University. Futch said Aliyu rented the Cessna plane to fly himself and a young woman to Savannah on Sunday evening. When they landed after returning to Statesboro, the woman exited the plane and walked toward the rear of the aircraft while Aliyu walked to the front. And when he did, the propeller hit him in the head, killing him instantly, Futch said. The Bullock County Sheriff's Office is investigating the incident. Officials say the single-engine Cessna 172 with four people on board landed without incident at the Statesboro Bullock County Airport around 10.35 p.m., so that would have been long after it became dark. Captain Todd Hutchins of the Bullock County Sheriff's Office said that deputies were sharing information they gathered 
with the FAA and NTSB. Quote, nobody was really at fault or anything. Hutchins said it was an accident. Well, I respectfully disagree with the captain that nobody was at fault. As I've mentioned before, you should never let a passenger board or get out of a plane with a propeller turning. Spinning propellers are hard to see, especially at night. And in my opinion, the pilots were not doing their job if they let these two people disembark with a running propeller. From texomashomepage.com, NTSB crash victim turned down offer from plane seller to practice takeoffs. The NTSB preliminary report was just released on the fatal plane crash last month at the Wichita Valley Airport, and it did not uncover any possible mechanical malfunctions that may have caused the crash. The crash at takeoff of the home-built single-engine two-seat Smith Sidewinder killed the pilot and lone occupant Todd Cox of Waldron, Arkansas. Cox bought the plane from the owner the morning of the accident, August 2022, and was dropped off at the airport so he could fly at home. The report says the owner of the plane met Cox at the airport and the two went over the maintenance logbooks, checklist, and operational features and examined the airframe and engine. Cox then purchased the plane and they started the engine and did a complete run-up to make sure the engine had power required for takeoff. According to the NTSB report, the seller offered to get in the plane for some practice takeoffs and landings, but Cox declined the offer. The previous owner stayed on the ground to watch takeoff and he and other witnesses said Cox made a three-point takeoff became airborne at low speed, and began a left turn climbing to 50 to 75 feet. Just as the plane assumed a nose-high attitude, the left turn tightened and it crashed into the ground east of the runway and burst into flames. And as I've mentioned before, there are a significant number of crashes associated with newly purchased aircraft. So you want to make sure that you get flight training in the aircraft type that you're buying before you buy your new aircraft. From aeronews.net, one life lost in East Hampton C-MAX M-22 accident. An accident described by witnesses as the in-flight breakup of a C-MAX M-22 has claimed the life of 57-year-old Kent Foering of Sagaponic, New York. Mr. Foering was the president of the East Hampton Aviation Association and a skilled aerobatic pilot. East Hampton Town Police received a 911 call shortly after 12.30 on Thursday, October 6, reporting a plane down along the water's edge of Three Mile Harbor's Oyster Shores. In an email, Captain Christopher Anderson of the East Hampton Town Police put forth that witnesses reported, quote, what appeared to be a wing that broke off the fuselage before the aircraft spiraled down into the water. FAA officials disclosed that the downed aircraft was a C-MAX M-22 fixed-wing two-seat amphibious seaplane of which Mr. Foyering had been the sole occupant. NTSB investigator Peter Knutson reported the C-MAX's right wing was discovered 500 to 1,000 feet from the main part of the aircraft wreckage. Mr. Knutson stated also that the accident had been captured on surveillance video. Sources close to Mr. Foyering indicated he acquired the C-MAX M-22, a Brazilian single-engine amphibious light sport aircraft, in May of 2022. The C-MAX M-22 sports a semi-cantilever high wing, atop which a single 100-horsepower Rotax 912 ULS engine is mounted in a pusher-prop configuration. From GeneralAviationNews.com, plane breaks up in flight when pilot loses control. The pilot reported that the Pipistrel Alpha trainer was at 5,000 feet and an engine power setting of 5,000 RPM when he began to pitch and roll to practice a chandelle. And by the way, if 5,000 RPM sounds high to you, that's because this is a Rotax engine and they typically have much higher RPM settings than Lycoming and Continental engines. At the start of the control inputs for the maneuver, he looked down at his kneeboard and personal electronic device and readjusted its position on his leg around the control stick. During this time, he told investigators that he may have released the back pressure on the control stick, but continued the turn. While focused on the knee board, he heard the engine RPM increase, then looked up and realized the plane had entered an unusual attitude. During this time, he became disoriented and tried to correct visually instead of by reference to the instruments. He inadvertently increased the rate of descent and was unable to determine the airplane's position as it rapidly gained airspeed. He then heard a pop sound and deployed the airplane's ballistic recovery system. The BRS system's parachute deployed successfully, and the airplane came to rest in trees near Rural Hall, North Carolina, without its left wing. The outboard section of the left wing was subsequently recovered, however the inboard section was not found. Probable cause, the pilot's failure to maintain airplane control and improper recovery from an unusual attitude which resulted in an in-flight breakup. From KDVR.com, no mechanical issues found after a horse-tooth plane crash. The NTSB said investigators did not find something wrong with a small plane's controls, which the pilot claimed to be the cause of the crash. 
The NTSB report stated that the pilot and flight instructor brothers were flying over the Horse Tooth Reservoir when they said they encountered an engine issue as they were flying in a Cessna 172. The pilot told investigators that to avoid anyone on the water, he decided to climb and head west. Witness photographs were included in the report showing that the plane was low over the water as it approached one of only three visible boats. The plane appeared headed toward the shore at first, but then it took a left and ended up flying low over one boat, climbed, took a right turn, and flew low and close to another boat before flying toward a valley, according to the report. And we talked about this accident a couple weeks ago. It occurred shortly after the plane appeared to make several low passes over boats in the reservoir. From avweb.com, hydrogen electric caravan proposed. Textron has teamed up with California-based Zero Avia to develop a hydrogen electric-powered caravan. The companies want to get an STC for the design, which will carry hydrogen in a wing tank to run Zero Avia's ZA600 powertrain in place of the PT6 that powers standard caravans. The two companies said in a joint release that carrying the hydrogen under wing leaves the fuselage free for its normal passenger and cargo load. Performance projections were not included in the release, but the duo hopes to have the plane in service by 2025. Zero Avia CEO Val Miftikoff said the famous Cessna Grand Caravan is on track to be one of the first airframes operating commercial services, both cargo and passenger, with hydrogen electric zero emission engines. In the image attached to this article is worth taking a look at it. There's a very large aerodynamically shaped tank under the left wing, which presumably holds the hydrogen. And finally, from WCIA.com, airport manager quits after accusations of drinking and driving on the runway. A shakeup at the Vermilion Regional Airport, which I think is in Illinois, occurred last week. Both the manager and maintenance manager quit their jobs during a special board meeting. The now former airport manager was suspended about two weeks ago. On Tuesday during the afternoon meeting, the airport's board laid out the accusations against her. She's accused of 24 policy violations, including conduct standards, with discipline violations, safety failures, ethical decisions, bullying, harassment, and drinking while driving on an airport runway. The interim manager, Rod Hightower, is filling her position. He read her accusations at the beginning of the meeting. Hightower said on September 8, 2022, she was driving a non-airport vehicle with a non-airport authority employee on board at a high speed on a runway while consuming alcohol. But now, after 21 months of the position, she's out. Board members said there was witness testimony backing up the violations. Well, that's the news for this week. Coming up next, a few of my updates, and then we'll talk all about airspace, all right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. And now let's go to the good news department and talk about those of you who are inspiring the rest of us with your accomplishments. First to Chen Chen, who soloed in an SR20. He's a local client of mine. Congratulations. And from mega supporter Troy Bainbridge, who writes that he just passed his initial type rating in the Cessna Citation 560 Ultra from a 142 school. It was a difficult check ride. Lots of systems and box items. Adding my commercial helicopter next and finishing up some primary students now. Busy, busy. Yeah, no kidding. Way to go, Troy. And from Patreon, Brett Ross, he writes, Hi, Max. I wanted to write and let you know that I added airplane single engine land to my glider private certificate today. That was October the 14th. Thanks for continuing to put aviation content out there. It's been invaluable to me. I'm hoping to add more to my monthly donation here shortly. Thanks. Well, thank you, Brett, and congratulations to you. And Brett did the opposite of what I'm looking to do sometime in the the next year. I've got an airplane single engine land rating, and I want to add my glider. He started with a glider, and he's just added his airplane single engine land. And from Patreon supporter John Slesser, he says, Thank you, Max. I just passed my instrument check ride today, and I want to thank you for helping me with all this great content. I fly an SR-20 G6 out of Torrance, California, and your show has been super helpful in making me a better pilot. Keep on rocking. Way to go, John. And from Quinn Kimball, who passed this CFII. He says, I'm a relatively new CFI and was recently introduced to your podcast by a student of mine and have been enjoying it immensely. There are always new things to learn as a pilot, and I learn something new with each episode. Your recent discussion of TIS, TAS, and ADSB traffic systems, for one, taught me a lot about a topic I thought I already understood. I just want to share that this past Friday, I passed my CFII. I look forward to keeping up with all your new content and we'll be making a donation as a small thank you for all that I've learned from the show. Keep up the great work. Congratulations, Quinn. 
And Billy Haug has passed his private. He says, just reaching out to you to inform you that I passed my private this weekend in Carson City, Nevada. He says, I actually had to fly the plane, a Cessna 150, from my home base, Minden Tahoe Airport, to KCXP because of a TFR at Minden for the Blue Angels Air Show. Kind of a cool check ride story. Anyway, thanks so much for all the incredible content. Continues to be a tremendously helpful and entertaining resource in my aviation journey. So congratulations to everyone on all of those great accomplishments. And if you've passed something recently, send me a note and let me know. We'll talk about it here on the show. Now, here's an email that came in from Mega Supporter Todd Cussell. He says, hope you're doing well. I'm amazed that after about 250 episodes, your show keeps getting better and better, and you haven't come close to running out of topics. Well, Todd, I'm amazed too. And not only is it amazing that we've reached 250 episodes, earlier this year, we passed 3 million downloads. Think about that. So 3 million hours of uh, content. So thanks to everybody who's been listening to the show and supporting it. Todd continues, I was just preparing for my first night flight, and I thought this would be a good show topic. And Todd, I did some research for you. It turns out episode 45 is when we did talk about uh, night flying, so check that out. He says, speaking of night flying tips, one of the most helpful for me is to fly my home sim, either X-Plane or MSFS, in a darkest room with night settings at the field that I'll be flying to or from. Yes, the flying part might be helpful, but since the taxi runway lights are generally correct in sims, I get most of the benefit out of taxiing. If anyone takes this advice, I highly recommend having ForeFlight or Garmin Pilot connected to the sim so you can follow along on the airport diagram. It is very comforting to land in my real-world physical airplane at a new-to-me airport and taxi into the FBO for the first time after having done it virtually before. (laughs) Okay, fly safe. Thanks so much, Todd, for that. And yes, if I think about some of the most difficult things I've ever encountered It is trying to taxi at an unfamiliar airport that's totally dark. I went in one time to, uh, I think it was Pine Mountain Lake, and there were just very few lights, and it was very difficult to uh, find my way around there for the first time at night. And here's an email from mega supporter Arjun Gururaj. He says, great shows, Max. I regularly fly SoCal into all the airports. In fact, there's probably not a single airport I haven't been into in Southern California. I would encourage your listeners to use the following website, and it's l-a-a-r-t-c-c dot org slash techroots, T-E-C roots. This is an excellent website to pull up while you are looking for the tech route as you get it from ground clearance. It'll give you the transition and all the waypoints and is easy to program into the panel. I always do this prior to getting into the airplane to get an idea of what I might get when I call ground on clearance. I never file for these. I've always found SoCal controllers extremely helpful and professional, especially if you ask for a tower and route routing. I'll be flying into Oceano L52 tomorrow morning, as you've stated on your post that it's an awesome airport and it's one that I haven't landed at before. I could work on my short field at Technique. Thank you, Max. And Archon was referring to a video that I posted for Patreon supporters last week. I'll be talking about more of a series of four videos that I took on that particular trip to Oceano. Uh, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. He did say later on that Dell 52 was an awesome visit, 2,300 feet, no worries, good food at the railroad diner, and very nice locals. Thanks for the advice. We'll be heading there again soon. And longtime supporter of the show, Vincent Salimi, wrote to say that the city of Pinole, California, issued a mayoral proclamation to Captain Christopher Benham this past week. In 2018, Christopher was the captain of the United Airlines Flight 1175 from San Francisco to Honolulu when the 777 had a catastrophic engine failure over the ocean. A hair crack on the engine blade was later found to be the cause of the explosion. All 381 souls landed safely, most of them from the Bay Area. Thanks for sending that along, Vincent. And let me tell you a little bit about my annual recurrent training in the SF-50 Vision Jet that I did in Knoxville last week. The biggest challenge was just getting there, as is usually the case. There are no direct flights to Knoxville, so I usually end up taking a connection. Unfortunately, the outbound flight from San Francisco arrived 45 minutes late. When we touched down in Dallas, I had just 25 minutes to get to my next flight. Unfortunately, Although both flights were scheduled to be out of the same terminal, our flight being late got moved to the B terminal instead of the A terminal. So I had to rush for the tram and I arrived at my next flight nine minutes before the flight, but the door was closed. (laughs) It was just impossible to get onto it. Of course, it was the last flight out for the night. There's a very long line at the customer assurance desk, but I found someone at one of the gates who took pity on me and rebooked me. I got a hotel at my expense, unfortunately. 
but uh, something was going on in town. So two or three of the first hotels I called were booked. I ended up being in the bed for maybe six hours, but only got about four hours of sleep. I flew into Tennessee the next morning. And first of all, I can tell you, it was really pretty to see the fall colors on the tops of all the ridges where it's colder. So fall is here and it was fun to see that. I arrived at about 1230, ate a sandwich, got thrown in the sim at 1 p.m. and I was totally exhausted. <laughs> I did okay on the maneuvers, but did not do very well on the emergencies. So that evening I took a two and a half hour nap, uh, got up for a couple more hours and then slept another seven hours and felt much better in the sim on day two. On uh, day three, I got a uh, 98% on my written exam. I had misread two questions because I was zipping through it fast. Otherwise it would have been a hundred. Um, I had a really good discussion with uh, one of the flight instructors, Jeff, about energy management for engine out maneuvering to an airport. So we'll see if we can get him on a future show to talk about that. I also had a good discussion with another instructor about when to slow down when being vectored for an instrument approach. As I mentioned in episode 249, I sometimes see pilots who aren't slowing up soon enough for an approach, especially if it's turbulent and you do want your passengers to want to fly with you again. So keep them in mind. On the last day, I did my check ride in the airplane. In previous years, we've done it in the simulator, which probably was a little easier than being in the simulator because I can't quite throw all the same emergencies at you in the airplane that they might in the sim. I'm happy to say that I passed with flying colors. The maneuvers were excellent. Uh, we started off by flying a circle to land at Chattanooga, KCHA, which is an airport that I hadn't been to before. And the night before I looked at Google Maps just to figure out what the references might be for when I would be within 1.8 miles of the runway. Now you might be thinking, wait a minute, Max, you're flying in category B, isn't that 1.7 miles? And there is a new table for circling distances. And if your MDA is below a thousand feet for category B, yes, it's 1.7 miles, but above a thousand feet, it's going to be 1.8 miles and it gets even longer the higher up you go. And I knew that there were going to be tools in the airplane that I could use to determine this, but I also wanted to have some outside visual references as well. So that worked really well. And by the way, I did learn a neat trick in the Garmin G3000, which I haven't tried in the NXI or perspective, but I'm guessing it still works. And this relates to surface watch, which is the system that basically tells you if you are landing on the wrong runway or the wrong taxiway or things like that. And historically, when we've done a circle to land, surface watch will start to yell at us as we start to land on the runway we're circling to and say wrong runway because it's not the one the approach was loaded to. Well, here's the fix for that. You just touch the title of the approach and it brings up a screen called landing data. And then you enter the runway that you will be circling to. That way you don't get the annoying wrong runway or alert just as you're landing. For my circle to land, I turned at an appropriate point. I told the examiner that we were now in a position to land and started to descend below the MDA. I was ever so slightly high on base, so I pulled the power back. I really prefer to have a higher descent rate on the base so that I can have a normal descent rate on the final. On final, I aim for the large aiming point rectangles and touch down on them on the center at the rectangles. Now, this is something I've had to force myself to learn in the jet. My home runway is just 2,500 feet long, and we don't have those aiming point rectangles. So we always just land beyond the numbers. And I sometimes see transition jet pilots do the same thing, heading for the numbers and not for the aiming point markers. Anyway, the rest of the check ride went well. The examiner complimented me on my flying and said I was good to go for another year, which is good because despite the vast number of check rides I've taken, I'm always just a little tiny bit nervous that I might not pass the next one. And of course, I think that's what keeps us on our toes and makes sure that we're sharp when we're doing our flying. And here's a recording from Robin. G'day, Max. It's Robin from Australia here. We really enjoy your podcast Down Under, and we do hope one day we can get you Down Under um, to do some flying in Australia. We've got our first CPPP happening next month in Orange in New South Wales. And as an instructor, I was wondering what you thought might benefit me the most with my mentor instructor flight as part of the CPPP, that's the Cirrus Pilots Proficiency Program. You must fly with a lot of people with various levels of experience. And I was just wondering whether you had any tips or suggestions for what I might do with my mentor instructor flight. I've got a fair bit of experience. I have a commercial pilot's license 
and I've done 15 IPCs, instrument proficiency checks. So I'm just wondering what you thought might benefit me the most with my instructor flight at the CPPP. Safe flying and thanks for your podcast. It's something that I really enjoy and every time I listen, I think I've learned something that may just one day save my life. Thanks very much, Max. Well, Robin, you are in for a real treat. I have been to Australia and I have taught at the CPPP, which is held at the Orange Regional Airport. First of all, you're going to really enjoy the facilities at the Orange Aero Club. I interviewed the gentleman that runs that and boy, they set a high bar for running an aero club and managing the general aviation activities in the airport. So definitely uh, learn what you can about the club and perhaps apply it to your own particular uh, airport I would suggest that there are two areas that are going to be uh, of most value to you. One, you didn't ask about this one, but the ground sessions. The ground sessions are fabulous. I would encourage you to uh, take lots and lots of notes, attend as many of the ground instruction sessions as possible. I'll tell you how good these are. I one time went to a CPPP just so that I could attend every ground session. I came back with pages and pages and pages of notes. These people know a lot about Cirrus aircraft, so you're going to really enjoy what you learn from the ground sessions. For the flight portion, I would say that there are two areas you might want to focus on. One is emergencies, and the other would be system failures. I think these are areas that just don't get focused on enough when people fly, and regardless of what aircraft that they fly. And you can really learn a lot if you just spend an hour or two on all these uh, different kinds of failures. So I would say look through the uh, checklist and pick a large number of system malfunctions, walk through those, pick a number of uh, emergencies. And here's something interesting about emergencies. I read a while ago that there's an airline which requires their crews as they taxi out to the runway to review one emergency. So think about that. On every flight, they're reviewing an emergency. And I think that's a great thing for pilots to do as well. So have a great time in Orange. Wish I were going to be down there with you. Thanks so much for your message, Robin. And a quick thank you to those of you who have purchased Lightspeed headsets by clicking on any of the links in our show notes. They have agreed to support the show by paying us a nice referral fee whenever people get to their website by first starting from our show notes. So just click on any of the links in any of the show notes that you find at aviationnewstalk.com if you have an interest in buying a Lightspeed headset. Now let me tell you a little bit about other folks who are supporting the show in other ways, and these are our Patreon supporters. We have a new mega supporter. Those are the folks that support us at the $50 a month level, and that's Pilot Life. And I'll tell you more about them in a future episode. And we have a number of other new members who've joined in the last two weeks. This first one, an $8 a month donation, is done in the memory of Kent Foyering. He's the gentleman we talked about in the news who died in the seaplane crash at East Hampton in Long Island. Other $8 a month donors include Anthony Alterio, Nick Reinhardt. At the $10 level, we have Mark. At the $20 a month level, we have John Slusser, Mike Duhamel. And at the $35 a month level, Mike Losey. We also had three people who edited their pledges upward. They include Brett Ross, David Malkin, and Peter DeVries. Thanks so much for your donations. And we had some one-time donors through PayPal. Thomas Kimball donated $20 and a repeat donation from Jamie Neal for $200 he donated last in 2019. Thank you so much for your donations. If you'd like to support the show, just go to aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome, where you can sign up via Patreon to support us at various monthly levels. Or for one-time donations or even monthly donations, go to aviationnewstalk.com slash PayPal if you'd like to use that method to donate. And I mentioned a moment ago videos. I've got uh, four and probably will eventually be five videos from a trip that I did with one of our Patreon supporters who came to visit from Colorado. We spent the day flying around in an SR-20. He wanted to go to Oceano, which is my favorite airport, partially because we've got bicycles where you can go directly from the airport to uh, downtown, which is a very short ride. A great little restaurant uh, right at the beach. I think the railroad diner where you can get some hamburgers. And then you can rent ATVs on the beach and go driving around. So I've already posted the first of those four videos. I'll be posting the next one, which is the actual landing at that very short airport in Oceano later this week. And if you'd like to see those videos, just sign up at the $20 a month level at Patreon. Coming up next, we're talking about airspace. All right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. And now let's talk about airspace, cloud clearances, and even measuring your distance from clouds. Now, in our recent commercial flight to Knoxville, I noticed that the passenger sitting next to me was reading ASA's private oral guide, 
which I always recommend to student pilots who are preparing for the oral portion of their check ride. And by the way, I think that knowing everything in that book is an excellent baseline for preparing you for the oral, but there's still more that you need to know in addition to what you'll find in the book. I learned that this gentleman, who's originally from Germany, flies out of Burlington, Vermont, a place I'm familiar with as one of my roommates from college, Andy Klockner, lives in Burlington. I asked what he planned to do with his private, and he said he hoped to fly to some of the fun places to hike in neighboring states that would otherwise take many hours to drive to. I thought I'd help him out on some of the questions that I see most student pilots struggle with. I'll get into airspace in a moment, which we'll talk about here at length, but first I ask him what a minimum equipment list is, and like the vast majority of student pilots I talk with, he got it wrong. Now the problem with the MEL is its name, which implies a meaning which is the exact opposite of what it really is. Also, it's something rarely seen in single-engine aircraft and is not required unless you're flying charter or for the airlines. And speaking of the airlines, on one of the legs of my trip to Knoxville last week, we were briefly delayed as the captain said a mechanic had to sign off on an electrical issue. Later, when I went to the lavatory, I saw that someone, either the captain or the mechanic, had left a small printout in the bathroom that said MEL, the aircraft's end number, and pilot seat electrical adjustment. Well, after we landed, as I walked by the captain, I asked if there was a manual adjustment for his seat. He must have wondered how I knew what it was that failed in the aircraft, but he simply replied that, yes, indeed, there is a manual adjustment for the seat, that he'd been unfamiliar with it, and that he had to go into the manual to read about it. Now, the MEL is the list of equipment that can break, and you can still fly the airplane. If you're wondering why such a list is useful, imagine that you and I have this large fortune that we'd like to shrink as quickly as possible, and so we decided to start an airline. Now, when something breaks, we'd want our pilots to be able to quickly determine whether they could still fly the plane with the item that was broken. So we'd put together a list of everything that might break, and the pilots would still be allowed to fly the airplane anyway. And that list is the MEL. So remember that if you have a private or commercial check ride coming up, as the examiner is required to ask you about the minimum equipment list. Now let's talk about airspace, which you'll also be quizzed about on both the private and commercial check rides. And let's jump to what may be the most confusing parts, which are the class E and G and the various cloud clearances associated with them. I started by asking him why we even had cloud clearance requirements. Just why is it that the FAA is trying to keep pilots a certain distance away from clouds? And he started talking about the dangers of clouds, such as icing you might pick up if you were in a cloud, and that the objective of cloud clearance distances was to keep pilots far away from clouds so that they don't accidentally blundered into them. And years ago, that's what I thought. And that's because I don't ever remember reading the FAA's airplane flying handbook anything about why we had to stay away from clouds. Now, generally, I find that pilots have an easier time remembering something if they understand the why of something, such as why do we require VFR pilots to stay far away from clouds? And here's why. The FAA didn't create cloud clearance requirements to keep private pilots from accidentally blundering into clouds. They designed these rules to protect the more important pilots, which I say jokingly. The important pilots are the ones who are flying IFR in the clouds. Think airliners with hundreds of people on board or even a single pilot on an IFR flight plan in the clouds in a Cessna 172. These pilots are safe when they're in the clouds because everyone in the clouds has to be on an IFR flight plan and has to talk with ATC with the exception of Class G airspace where it's technically legal for instrument pilots to be in the clouds without an IFR clearance. And while it may be legal, I've never heard of anyone actually doing that. So instrument pilots are safe when they're within the clouds, as ATC is talking with everyone in the clouds, except perhaps some rogue pilot who's flying in the clouds without a clearance, and hopefully there are none of those out there. But there's a big safety issue when instrument pilots come out of the clouds, and that issue is that they must now avoid any VFR pilots who are flying close to the clouds. And depending upon how fast they're moving, or how quickly they're climbing or descending, there might not be a lot of time to avoid a VFR pilot who's flying close to a cloud. And that's why we have cloud clearance requirements. When teaching airspace, I always start by teaching the requirements for class E below 10,000 feet, as they're the most universal. Those requirements are the same for class C and class D, and for nighttime class G between 1,200 and 10,000 feet. So when you learn those requirements, you now know the requirements for a lot of other airspace as well. 
The requirement for flying VFR in Class E below 10,000 feet is that you must have three mile visibility and you also have to stay at least 1,000 feet above the clouds, 500 feet below the clouds, and at least 2,000 feet horizontally from the clouds. And if you take the first number of each of those requirements, you have the numbers 152, which is the same as the popular Cessna 152 training aircraft. So many people abbreviate the requirements by simply saying 3 C-152 as a way of remembering the three mile visibility requirement and the cloud clearance requirements. Now I used to have trouble remembering whether I had to stay a thousand feet above the clouds and 500 feet below the clouds, which is correct, or the opposite, which would be 500 feet above the clouds and a thousand feet below the clouds, which is incorrect. Now one easy way to remember this is that basic VFR, which we need to fly in class D or C, is three mile visibility and a ceiling of 1000 feet or higher. If we had to stay a thousand feet below the clouds, well, that would be impossible if the clouds were at a thousand feet. So clearly the smaller number, 500 feet, is for flying below the clouds. But why is it that way? Now think about a passenger jet descending on an ILS as it comes in to land at an airport. It may be descending at perhaps eight, 900 feet per minute. So when it pops out of the bottom of a cloud, it's coming out of the cloud relatively slowly. So if there's a plane flying 500 feet below the cloud, there should be plenty of time for both planes to see and avoid each other. And that's why the cloud distance requirement below a cloud is just 500 feet. Now think about the larger requirement of a thousand feet above the clouds. Why do we need a greater distance when we fly above the clouds? Well, think about a passenger jet taking off. How fast does a jet climb? Maybe two or 3000 feet per minute. So when that jet pops out of the top of a cloud, it's climbing significantly faster than jets descending out of a cloud on an ILS. And that's why we need the greater cloud clearance of a thousand feet when we're flying above a cloud. And we need to be an even greater distance horizontally from a cloud, which would be 2000 feet. So why do we need a greater distance? First, think about the speed limit below 10,000 feet, something you don't think about much if you're flying a Piper Cub, but which you do think about if you're flying a jet. Below 10,000 feet, aircraft can be flying as fast as 250 knots, which means if two aircraft are pointed at each other, the maximum closing rate of those two aircraft below 10,000 feet is 500 knots indicated. Now note that your true airspeed would be a little higher than that. With a 500 knot closing speed between two aircraft, the distance between those two planes is decreasing by about eight nautical miles every minute at about 840 feet every second. So in the worst case of two 250 knot planes pointed at each other, they have about 2.3 seconds to see and avoid each other if they first spot each other when they're 2000 feet apart. Fortunately, that's the worst case. And usually you'll have more time to spot a plane coming out of a cloud. But as you can see, there's still not a lot of time to avoid each other. And now let's talk about cloud clearance requirements for class E above 10,000 feet. Above 10,000 feet, VFR pilots are required to have a minimum of five mile visibility and they must stay at least a thousand feet above the clouds, a thousand feet below the clouds, and one statute mile horizontally from the clouds. And the good news is that these requirements are the same for all class E and class G airspace above 10,000 feet. The first difference to notice is that you now have to stay a thousand feet below the clouds. Why? Because below 10,000 feet, airliners are descending slowly along an ILS, but above 10,000 feet, they're often descending quite rapidly at two or even 3000 feet per minute. So we need more time to spot these rapidly descending aircraft and staying a thousand feet below the clouds instead of 500 feet gives us more time to look for these rapidly descending IFR aircraft. Above 10,000 feet, there are no speed restrictions. So you'll routinely encounter airlines flying along twice as fast above 10,000 feet. So instead of staying 2000 feet horizontally from a cloud, the distance is increased to one statute mile to give you more time to spot an aircraft popping out of the side of a cloud. And the clearance above the clouds remains the same at a thousand feet above the clouds. That stays the same because above 10,000 feet, planes aren't popping out of the top of clouds any faster than they are below 10,000 feet. In fact, at those higher altitudes, they're climbing a little more slowly. So you actually have a little more time to spot them. Above 10,000 feet, the minimum visibility increases to five statute miles to give us more time to spot the faster moving aircraft. So below 10,000 feet, we have three miles C-152 and above 10,000 feet, we have five miles F-111, just like the fighter jet. Just remember that in the 111, two of those ones represent a thousand feet and the other one represents one mile. Often I hear people tell me that above 10,000 feet, 
you have to stay a thousand feet above, a thousand feet below, and a thousand feet horizontally from clouds, which is incorrect. It makes no sense to decrease the required horizontal distance from a cloud from 2,000 feet to 1,000 feet when you're above 10,000 feet where everyone is faster. So remember that one of the ones in F111 is actually one mile, not 1,000 feet. I mentioned earlier that the C-152 cloud clearance distances apply in Class C and Class D, but I didn't mention Class B because it's different. Years ago, before September 1993, the same C-152 cloud clearance requirements did apply to Class B, which was then called the TCA, but then it was changed to what it is presently, which is three-mile visibility and clear of clouds, which means that when you're in VFR in Class B, you can literally be flying right next to a cloud as long as you're not touching the cloud. So why would they relax the cloud clearance requirements in Class B, which is arguably some of the airspace where you'd like the most protection since there's so many airliners flying in and out? Well, the answer is that in Class B, ATC is fully aware of the position of every aircraft in that airspace. Unlike Class E, where there are many aircraft flying around not talking to ATC, in Class B, every aircraft has a clearance and ATC is talking with all of them. And they're using radar to keep all of those aircraft well separated from each other. So if you're flying a VFR in Class B and you're right next to a cloud, you can guarantee that there aren't any airplanes in that cloud next to you because ATC is keeping all the planes well separated from each other. And you don't have to worry about an airplane suddenly coming out of the clouds directly at you. So in Class B, the requirements for VFR pilots are three-mile visibility and clear clouds. One way to think about cloud clearance requirements is to think about when the FAA is going to be more permissive or less permissive. And in general, they're going to be less permissive when you're higher and aircraft are faster and more permissive in Class G airspace, which is uncontrolled, and more permissive as you get close to the ground in Class G, where you'll never encounter an airliner flying that low. The FAA is also less permissive at night because night flying is inherently more dangerous. Now let's switch gears and talk about Class G or uncontrolled airspace. Class G above 10,000 feet is simple as it's the same as Class E, which is 5-mile visibility in F-111. And to help remember the Class G visibility and cloud clearance requirements for the rest of Class G, remembering when the FAA is more or less permissive can help you in memorizing the airspace. In the daytime between 1,200 feet AGL and 10,000 feet, the FAA is more permissive in Class G since it's daytime, and in this airspace, you can fly with just one mile visibility in C-152. At night, the FAA is less permissive, so in Class G between 1,200 feet AGL and 10,000 feet at night, the requirements go back to three miles in C-152, the same as Class E below 10,000 feet. Now, below 12,000 feet in Class G, things get a little more complicated. The first challenge when you're low to the ground, which I hope you never are except to take off or to land, is figuring out whether you're in Class G or Class E airspace. Generally, when you're outside of Class B, C, and D airspace, there's a thin layer of Class G next to the ground, and at some altitude, Class E starts above this thin layer of Class G. To find out which type of airspace you're in, you need to pull out a sectional chart. Then look for an area of magenta shading around an airport or even a group of airports. If you are inside the magenta shading, the Class G goes from the surface up to 700 feet AGL. Or, in most cases, if you're outside the magenta shading, the Class G goes up to 1200 feet AGL. The exception is if you're outside the blue shading that surrounds the magenta shading. Now, this blue shading is hard to find in most areas of the U.S., but if you are outside the blue shading, which occurs most often in mountainous areas, that Class G goes all the way up to 14,500 feet. But in recent years, a lot of the Class G above 12,000 feet AGL has been eliminated, so it's becoming harder to find. Whenever you're in Class G that's below 1,200 feet, whether it's inside the magenta shading or inside the blue shading, you're allowed to fly in the daytime in one mile visibility and clear of clouds. Having done that once in my career while flying special VFR into my home airport, I can tell you that one mile visibility and clear of clouds is something you should avoid doing at all cost. The only circumstances I would even consider doing it would be at my home airport, which I know like the back of my hand. Doing it anywhere else than a place where you've had hundreds if not thousands of prior landings is absolutely nuts. So why do we have to stay below 700 feet in the magenta shaded areas if we want to fly in weather that's as poor as one mile visibility and clear of clouds? Because generally these magenta shaded areas are around airports with instrument approaches. And pilots flying instrument approaches often pop out of the clouds fairly close to the ground. 
And what the magenta essentially means is if you're going to insist upon flying in one mile visibility in clear clouds, then the FAA is going to force you to stay below 700 feet AGL where you're less likely to encounter an instrument pilot flying in an approach to that airport. But if you get farther away from the airport and you're outside the magenta shading, we'll let you do your silly one mile clear of clouds flying as high as 1200 feet AGL. And this is a very good time to note the difference between legal and safe. Just because it's legal under some circumstances to fly on one mile visibility in clear clouds doesn't mean it's safe. As I mentioned before, in 50 years of flying, I've done it once that I recall. It was very disconcerting, especially as it was before the days of moving maps. And I would strongly discourage you from flying VFR in those conditions. The final airspace category we'll talk about is Class G below 1,200 feet at night. If you've followed the logic of when the FAA is more permissive or less permissive, you've probably guessed that since it's night, they'll be less permissive than they are in the daytime for Class G below 1,200 feet. And in this airspace at night, the requirement jumps back up to match that of Class E, and that's three-mile visibility in C-152. But there is one exception to these cloud clearance requirements, and it's an odd one. When you're in Class G below 1,200 feet at night, if you can stay within one half mile of a runway, you're permitted to fly in one mile and clear of clouds. And having seen how bad that looks in the daytime, I can tell you it'd be absolutely nuts to fly in one mile clear of clouds at night. And for most aircraft I've flown, the standard traffic pattern takes you more than a half mile from the runway. So I don't see how this exception is useful, except perhaps for an aircraft that was taking off and climbing rapidly into much better weather conditions. And now that you know how far you have to stay away from clouds, the bigger question is, when you're flying near a cloud, how do you know how far you are from that cloud? Now, it would be nice if we could use a laser range finder to measure our distance to clouds, but I haven't seen one and don't really know how practical that would be in an airplane. There is, however, a way that you could roughly measure your distance from clouds. I've never seen or heard anyone talk about this method, and I did write it up for the original version of the FAA's Conducting an Effective Flight Review Booklet. However, it's no longer in the latest edition, though my name is still mentioned in the credits. Now, the principle is very simple. Somewhere in a math class, you must have learned that an isosceles right triangle is a right triangle with two equal length legs. There's a 90 degree angle between the two legs of equal length, and the third side is the longest side, and it lies opposite the 90 degree angle, and it's called the hypotenuse. And 45 degree angles on each end of the hypotenuse connect the hypotenuse to the two equal length legs. Now imagine you're in flight in a Cessna 172, and you see a cloud coming up ahead, and you're going to pass to the left of it, and you wonder, will that cloud be at least 2,000 feet horizontally to your right as you pass by it? And to make things easy, let's say that our 172 has a ground speed of 120 knots. To calculate the distance of the cloud, we'll continue flying until the beginning of the cloud is at a 45 degree angle from the aircraft's nose. Now to make it even simpler, there's a 90 degree angle between our aircraft's nose and the leading edge of our wing. When you first spotted the cloud, it was just slightly to the right of the nose. As you get closer and closer, it moves more to the right. So when the beginning of the cloud is halfway between the aircraft's nose and the leading edge of the right wing, it's now at a 45 degree angle. At this point, start your timer. Then, just as the beginning of the cloud reaches the front of your right wing, stop the timer. And because a right angle consists of two equal length legs, the distance from your wingtip horizontally to the cloud is equal to the distance that you just flew while the timer was running. At 120 knots, it takes 9.8 seconds to fly 2,000 feet. So if you timed more than 10 seconds from the time the cloud was at a 45 degree angle until the time it reached your wingtip, you're more than 2,000 feet horizontally from the cloud. If you time for less than 10 seconds, then you're less than 2,000 feet horizontally from the cloud. If you're flying an SR-22 at 180 knots, then you'll travel 2,000 feet in about six and a half seconds. You can also use a timer to determine whether you're more than or less than 500 feet below a cloud. If you're approaching a cloud that's above you, Wait until the beginning of the cloud is at a 45 degree angle above you, and then start the timer. Stop the timer as the beginning of the cloud passes overhead. At 120 knots, it takes 2.5 seconds to fly 500 feet. So if you timed more than 2.5 seconds, then you're at least 500 feet below the clouds. At 180 knots, you'll travel 500 feet in just 1.6 seconds. You can also determine whether you're going to be 1,000 feet above a cloud, by starting the timer when the beginning of a cloud is at a 45 degree angle below you. At 120 knots, if it takes you 
more than five seconds to reach the cloud, you're more than a thousand feet above the cloud. At 180 knots, if it takes you more than 3.3 seconds to reach the cloud, you're more than a thousand feet above the cloud. In all of these cases, I've talked about the beginning of a cloud. You could also measure distances if you're above or below a solid layer of clouds. Since there's no beginning of the cloud in that case, just pick any distinct and recognizable point in the cloud as the point for when you start and stop your timing. Well, there you have it. My thanks to everyone who supports the show in whatever way you do it, whether it's by telling a friend about the show, writing a nice five-star review on whatever app that you're listening to, sending us your email and feedback, or supporting us at aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome or aviationnewstalk.com slash PayPal. So until next time, fly safely, have fun, and keep the blue side up.